in my 20s, after we had been on a long biking trip together, he said, I want you to have my diaries when I die. And I was so stunned. And of course, I imagined they offered a window into a person who I found quite mysterious. I couldn't react as a reporter might and say, well, why me? Or, you know, I actually I did say why me? And he said, you're the writer. But he just said it in a kind of brushing it off kind of way that did not invite further scrutiny. But um, does that mean he wants you to write about him or that he wants you to appreciate him as a writer? Could be either of those or could be that you're the only one who would be likely to be interested. Because you're, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the kind of person he was. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. he would have okay. been self-deprecating about it. And yet, on the other hand, he's handing me this extraordinary, I would say, gift or curse, whatever you, whatever right, you want right. to think of it as. Yeah. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, but but I don't know what to say there anymore. I used to say, but you knew that, and then two weeks ago, my nine-year-old daughter told me, hey, that's dumb. Don't say that anymore. And of course, she got in my head the way only a nine-year-old daughter can get in your head, and now I don't know what, I, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe it is dumb. What if she's right? She wouldn't not tell me the truth, so here I am. I probably should have written a new tagline before I turned on the mic, but I thought I'd improv it thanks to those incredible improv skills I learned in three and a half sessions at Improv Olympics West in 2005, but uh, they didn't come through just now. Anyway, it's a great day to be alive. I hope the sun is shining wherever life finds you today. I have a great interview, very thought-provoking interview to share with you today. My guest name is Janie Scott. She is the author of a book called The Beneficiary, Fortune, Misfortune, and the Story of My Father. Let me ask you something. Have you ever like driven by and looked at the biggest house in your town with the most incredible yard, maybe a gate, maybe a stately looking mansion and a flag fluttering in the wind out front? Or have you been on vacation and visited a place like Biltmore House in Asheville or some of those cottages in Newport, Rhode Island and just thought, wow, these people must have had just a perfect, perfect life. How could you not have a perfect life with all this money? Well, that's a logical and understandable thought to have as you're looking at incredible opulence. And so that's what makes Janie's story so interesting. Janie grew up on an 800-acre estate outside of Philadelphia that was the byproduct of a fortune that came from the railroads in the olden days. And in her book, as I mentioned, The Beneficiary, Fortune, Misfortune, and the Story of My Father, she lays out not just the incredible opulence, but a lot of the misfortune that was highly related to the fortune in her family. And I know you'll find this conversation interesting. Before we jump into it, though, I want to say a few things. Number one, hello, new users. How are you? I'm glad you're here. This is Crazy Money, a show on which we explore the connection between money and happiness through the lens of my guests' expertise or money journeys, much like we'll learn from Janny from her money journey today. Hey, do you ever use this thing called Facebook? It's a website. It's one word, facebook.com. If you use it, there's a great new tool on there called the Crazy Money Podcast Listeners Group, and I'd love for you to join it. On there, we discuss some of the guests we've had on the show. I take suggestions for questions you can ask upcoming guests and suggestions for the guests themselves, whom I will then hunt down via email or their websites to get them to talk to me. So search on Facebook. Crazy Money Podcast listeners, and you'll find the group, or you can just click the link in the show notes. There's another important link in the show notes that I want to draw your attention to, and this is about our previous guest, Peter Singer. Peter, you will remember, is a professor of philosophy at Princeton University. The New Yorker called him the world's most influential living philosopher. He is a strong advocate, not just of effective altruism, but of aggressive altruism, wherein those of us with resources in the West should be giving a high percentage, much more than the traditional 10% tithe, a much higher percentage of our resources to help out those who are starving or facing disease in the developing world. His book on the topic, The Life You Can Save, has been available for free from his website, and there's a link to the PDF on his website that you can uh, see in the show notes. But it has just been released as an audio book on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcast apps and it features reading, uh, narration, I suppose you would call it, by Kristen Bell, Paul Simon, Stephen Fry, and other notable global celebrities. See the link in the show notes. Check it out. If you haven't read that book, it's very much worth your time and consideration as to the duties, the obligations, and the opportunity all of us who have more than we need have to share those resources with the rest of the world. 
Hey, by the way, if you like what we're doing here on Crazy Money, I sure would appreciate it if you take a moment to subscribe and rate and review the show. The number of ratings and reviews are an indication to Apple and other podcast distributors that there is a passionate, loyal audience behind the show and helps encourage new listeners to check out what we're doing here. And I think it's important. I hope you think it's important. So if you do, take a second to write a review. All right, let's talk about Janie Scott. As I mentioned, Janie grew up on an 800-acre estate outside of Philadelphia. She was the descendant of railroad barons and financial magnates. Janie tracks her family's multi-generational wealth in her book, The Beneficiary, Fortune, Misfortune, and the Story of My Father. She does not skimp on details of the opulence or the tragic complications of her family's vast resources. Of course, things appeared perfect from the outside, but while doing so, alcoholism, suicide, divorce, and idleness derailed many of her close relations. In this conversation, we talk about what it was like to grow up on a property the size of Central Park and the way that affected her attitudes about money today. Janie worked for 14 years as a reporter for the New York Times, where she was a member of the team that won the 2000 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. Prior to that, she worked for the LA Times and the record of Bergen County. Her first book, A Singular Woman, The Untold Story of Barack Obama's Mother, earned her a nomination for the Penn Jacqueline Begard Weld Award for Biography and was named Time Magazine's Top 10 Nonfiction Books of 2011. The Beneficiary, her most recent book, was one of New York Times' 100 Most Notable Books of 2019 and NPR's Favorite Books of 2019. Janie has appeared on The Colbert Report, Today, C-SPAN, Fresh Air, and many other national TV and radio shows. She is a graduate of Harvard College and spoke to me from her home in New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Janie Scott. Janie Scott, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be here. Janie, you're the author of a book called The Beneficiary, Fortune, Misfortune, and the Story of My Father. Can you briefly describe the content in the book and tell us why you wanted to write it? I will give it a shot. I grew up in the 50s and 60s and early 70s on a 800-acre British-style country estate about a half an hour outside of what at the time was the fourth largest city in the country. When I was a child there in the late 50s and early 60s, there were four generations of my father's family living there. It was a functioning dairy farm, as I say, very near the city of Philadelphia. It was a completely rarefied existence. I moved away from there when I was 14. My family moved to England. And while my parents moved back there, I never did. I went on to become a journalist and reporting all over the country and then various parts of the world. And my father died in 2005, a rather strikingly self-destructive end to a life that had started off in a way that you might imagine was charmed. And I had always adored my father, but been puzzled by him. He had become a serious alcoholic and died of cirrhosis of the liver. And I just thought after he died, and it became clear to me that there were a number of interesting family papers going back several generations from the four generations that had lived on this estate that were kicking around, I thought, I'll take a look at what was there and maybe there would be a book in it. And I realized after months of going through all these sort of random papers that it might be possible to not only piece together this piece of American history of sort of spanning the entire 20th century, but also plumb the story of my father's life and to me, his rather perplexing end. So that's why I got into it. And indeed, there is much to learn about wealth over the past couple of centuries from the story. So let's go back in time. Where did the family fortune come from? Well, interestingly, the details of that were pretty obscure to me for most of my life, and I really only got a handle on it in working on the book and hiring a researcher to go back into whatever documentation there was beyond what I had, you know, newspapers and advertising and business publications, etc. So there were two streams of wealth. The place had been built in the early 20th century at the end of the Gilded Age by my father's grandfather, a man named Robert Leeming Montgomery, who at a young age had become a very successful investment banker just at the moment that investment banking was undergoing something of a transformation and a lot of money was coming into it before the tax laws had changed. So he made a considerable fortune, not a Carnegie style fortune, but a middling American fortune in the early 20th century. His eldest daughter, who's a major character in this book and who was my father's mother, who became well-known later for being 
the model, the inspiration for the character of Tracy Lord in the Philadelphia story, she married a man named Edgar Scott, whose grandfather had been Thomas Alexander Scott, who was president of the Pennsylvania Railroad when it was the most profitable corporation in North America, I believe in the biggest freight carrier in the world or something like that. I mean, hugely successful uh, man who passed on much of his wealth, not all of it, to his children and grandchildren. So these two strands, the railroad fortune, typical of you know Pennsylvania, the mid-Atlantic states during that period, and a financing fortune came together in the early 20th century in this place. And it manifests in an estate called Ardrossan. How did the estate come into being? I got the sense in going back through all the correspondence and business communications of my grandfather, that my great grandfather, that he was an ambitious man who was very conscious of his place in the world and in that society. And it was at a time when enormous amounts of money were churning out of Philadelphia that basically funded what came to be known as the main line, this stretch of wealthy suburbs that still exists heading west from Philadelphia. And the main line was built by people like my great-grandfather. It was originally a development project of the Pennsylvania Railroad Corporation, but it involved attracting uh, wealthy people to what had been farmland who built these uh, very blatantly British inflected estates, you know, with dairy farms and chateaus and emulating really the British country life. And so I think he was interested in probably tax avoidance to some extent eventually in buying up a lot of land and houses. Uh, He was also interested in creating a kind of dynastic situation for his children and grandchildren, which it became. So he bought up not just one farm, but lots of farms and merged them together and had houses into which his four children and their children moved when they came of age. You did say it was a British estate plucked from the pages of Jane Austen. And you mentioned earlier that it was 800 acres. 800 acres is about the size of Central Park in New York City. So we're not talking about a modest piece of property here. (laughs) <laughs> Modest it was not, yes. I have to say, to give it credit, it was extremely beautiful and something I'd grown up with, as I say, for my first 14 years and never understood that that beauty wasn't completely natural and had been there from time immemorial. I discovered in rooting around in my great-grandfather's papers that in many ways a projection of his ego and ambition and aesthetic tastes, and he had you know, shaped the landscape and moved trees and created a forest in order to block the view of a house coming up two miles away. (laughs) It had, as I say, a functioning dairy farm that at its peak was 300 cows, as I say, a short distance from Philadelphia. It had multiple swimming pools, tennis courts. My father built a kennel there. There was a broodmare stables built by the great grandfather with, you know, horses, a stallion imported from Ireland, and the original cows, the original nine dairy cows were imported from Scotland. Uh, So it was a quite grand thing. And the house itself, the big house, as it was called, in which my great-grandparents lived, was 50 rooms uh, designed by Horace (laughs) Trumbauer, the architect who designed the Philadelphia Art Museum, Widener Library at Harvard, and various big houses in Rhode Island. So yeah, modesty was not what they were looking for. You mentioned the forest that he built, a bespoke forest, as one person described it, just what God would have done if he had the money. And I thought that was a pretty apt way of talking about the ambition of that project. Yeah, the funny thing is, I mean, I guess this tells you a lot about the way we see the world, you know. I just took all that stuff for granted, Um, (laughs) not just the the forest and that it happened naturally, but all of it. You know, I was only a child and I was living in a place that was, we were not alone in having a lot of land and money. And so it wasn't that exotic. I did understand at least that my grandmother was the only grandmother I knew of who had a herd of 300 cows. But beyond that, it was just, and this was the message we got from my family, our great good fortune that we should be living in this wonderful place. And do you think it was an immortality project on behalf of uh, the gentleman who established the estate? Was he trying to live forever through the physical body of that property? I suppose. I suppose. It was probably a number of things. As I say, probably to some extent tax-related, to some extent dynastic, which is perhaps a bid for immortality. You know, he wanted 
a big family that would surround him and go on for generations. There was a phrase in that family, not novel to them, in our unity is our strength. They seemed to feel, and both my great-grandparents, I discovered, were left motherless at a very young age by the very early premature deaths of their mothers. So I think it was about family. I think it was about ego and competition with other Philadelphia Gilded Age fat cats of the period. And yes, probably to some extent about immortality because they made an effort to make sure this thing would go on for many generations. Now, there's dozens of interesting characters in your family tree, and I thought maybe we'd use them as demonstrations as how fortunes come to be and then the effect those fortunes have on the offspring. So let's talk about the colonel. Who was the colonel? The colonel is the person I mentioned, Robert Leeming Montgomery. We grew up knowing of him only as the colonel. I had no idea where his money had come from, except that there happened to be a investment banking firm stock brokerage in Philadelphia that for a while had his name and then merged with another one. And unfortunately for me, ended up with my name just coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he was a man who'd grown up in the area. His family had been there for a while. And his mother, I guess, had come from a wealthy family. So when she died, when he was very young, the family was a bit strapped. His father had been a lawyer and he went and then married the nanny that he hired to raise his three children and had eight more children. So the colonel, who we came to know him as, grew up first with a sense of wealth and position. And then that was undercut by this whole new course that his father had taken. So he left school at a young age, like 16, and went to work as a clerk, I think, at Drexel, which was related at the time, I think, to J.P. Morgan. And then, I may be getting that wrong, it's in the book, (laughs) and then worked his way up very fast by shrewd association with other wealthy people uh, to starting his own firm in 1907. And by 1914, they had made a lot of money. One of the interesting things I discovered, which I'd never known, was that by 1921, he had left the firm. He had been sort of pushed out by his um, partners. And he then also, in World War I, he had been appointed to handle the finances for an attempt to build up the Air Force for the United States an attempt that was catastrophically bad. Enormous amounts of money were spent. I'm not saying it was entirely his fault. Huge amounts of money were spent and very few war planes were created. We ended up borrowing old planes from the French. And this led to a scandal and a congressional investigation that I came to understand in my research really undermined the colonel's confidence in himself. And he had always been a kind of leader kind of guy. And apparently it really threw him back on his heels. And he retired from business at a young age. And perhaps that explains a bit about the expansionism of Ardrossan. By that point, he'd started Ardrossan, but he continued to annex other farms during this period. And then he kind of worked his way back into investing later. But he became largely, I think, a man of leisure managing what his wealth had accomplished. Oh, I should mention that in the early 30s, that would be the beginning of the Great Depression, He and his wife bought a former rice plantation in South Carolina as a sort of shooting retreat. There were a lot of rich Northerners going up and buying this relatively inexpensive land there after plantations had ceased to do what they had originally done. And so he would spend a lot of time in South Carolina hanging around, and as I understand it from my grandmother, drinking quite a lot. And he died at a relatively young age in 1949 and left all this behind. There's only so much to do in South Carolina, in fairness. Drinking being (laughs) a prime activity. Now, one of the most fascinating characters and tragic characters in the book in your family tree is named Edgar T. Scott. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Yes, Edgar T. Scott. I knew nothing about Edgar T. Scott before I embarked on this. He was actually my grandfather's father, my paternal grandfather's father. I grew up right next door to my grandparents. I saw them all the time, and I had no memory of hearing my grandfather talk really about his side of the family, even though it turned out, I now know, that he'd grown up in a house just as large as our Drossen, about 15 minutes away. We'd heard nothing about this house. We would never went to visit it. And the story of his father, it turns out, is quite tragic. His father was the son of Thomas Alexander Scott, the Pennsylvania Railroad president, 
his father died when he was about seven or eight, and he went off to France with his mother at that time when a lot of Americans were going to France for sort of cultural education. And he was parked in a British boarding school. Then he was parked from there at Groton, the American boarding school in Groton, Massachusetts, that had been set up to sort of inculcate a conscience in the children of the Gilded Age. And he didn't do very well in school. He then went to Harvard had to leave several times for reasons that the records suggest were either about some kind of health issues or that he was just not doing any work. He never eventually graduated. He went back twice, but didn't graduate. And his mother rewarded him by acquiring for him, I think renting, but it may have been buying, a gigantic yacht on which he and his friends, including his mother for part of it, would travel around the world for the next two years. It didn't quite pan out to be two years. One friend died along the way, uh, but that was his start off in life. And he never really worked. Uh, He had a brief job for a couple of years in the French embassy in France, the American embassy in France, and then returned and presided over his various pieces of property, including an absolutely enormous house in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine. It turns out, while he was said to have died heroically during World War I, he, in fact, I discovered, and there was some suggestion of this before, had killed himself under circumstances that seemed to involve drinking a woman and what would have been considered going AWOL in someone who didn't have the social cred that he had. And that was during World War I. He was working as an ambulance driver. He went there intending to work as an ambulance driver, but that's not quite what happened. But he was working at the time that he killed himself as a translator for an important general. Ah. So he did end up doing some work there, but he went off the rails, apparently got sort of sick and then left the place he'd been sent to recuperate and was in Paris doing various things before he returned and was confronted and the next morning shot himself. And you have this profound insight into his thinking not long before he killed himself. Can you tell us how you discovered what was going on in his head? There were various collections of papers, particularly in the big house at Ardrossan, but also in my mother's house where my father had lived before my parents split up after 42 years of marriage. And in a box, a metal box that I found in a closet in my mother's house was a whole collection of papers that related to the life of Edgar T. Scott. They had been put together by his widow for the benefit of her children, and they included an envelope that said, destroy before opening. Somebody had already opened it, but there were a number of documents in there, and I think one of them was in that envelope, that included a letter that my great-grandfather, Edgar T. Scott, had written to himself uh, when he got this job, uh, you know, six or seven months before he killed himself, saying, this is my chance to prove myself finally to my family, to my employer, to my country, to the world, you know, to show that I'm of some value and to earn my family's love. And so you get a sense that if that's what he was feeling when he embarked upon this job, his sort of first moment of attempt to redeem himself for a life that he had acknowledged earlier in other correspondence felt a little bit disappointing and insufficient, uh, that when he went off the rails, it was a shame and a humiliation, which was going to be public because of who he was, uh, that he just couldn't bear. And if you'll indulge me reading your words back to you, you reflect on reading those words and the concept of worthiness that he felt he lacked in his life. You say, how could the pampered heir of a railroad fortune ever have felt worthy in the absence of work? Were racket sports expected to help? Was he to have derived a sense of his own value and purpose from commissioning palaces for himself, using money made by a father he had barely known? I think that puts into pretty clear contrast His reality versus the expectation of a lot of people that might think that this was one of the most lucky people on the planet. Yes. And of course, he was one of the most lucky people on the planet. But along with that comes all sorts of other complexities. And that, I think, is a message that emerges from not just his story, but the story of a number of my members of my father's family. Um, Not all of them. Different people seem to respond to what they would call good fortune in different ways. Some people, like my grandmother, it worked for perfectly, and she lived probably exactly the life that she wanted. But I got the sense that for others, including, as you point out, my great-grandfather, and to some extent my father, it was a much more ambiguous, mixed heritage than the outsider would think. Reflecting on 
all these people that had to deal with the blessing that life had presented them with, I mean, to what does one aspire when they're raised in such magnificence? Uh, Well, I can only really speak authoritatively about my generation and perhaps my father's generation. In my father's generation, coming of age as adults in the early 50s, late 40s and early 50s, there was a lot of pressure to move back onto that place, take up your position in the family, maybe even take up your position in a family firm. And to do, they weren't worthless lives at all. I mean, for the last few generations, certainly all the men had worked and they had contributed to the community in various ways. But that life on that place and keeping that place going was a large part of the obligation. So yeah, it's a good question. And the problem, the thing I sensed in studying particularly my father's life and even thinking about my own is that you make decisions about your life pretty early, big decisions in your life pretty early about what kind of work you're going to do, children, marriage, that sort of thing. You make them really before you fully understand the implications of this wealth into which you've been born. Because at least in our family, there was not a lot of focus on the implications of all this largesse. And it was in some ways admirably played down as though we were kind of just another family. We just happened to be living on this 800 acre estate. You said that your father's generation didn't think of themselves as rich. Yeah, it's not even just his generation. I would say that the family, at least the way it came across to me was they would never have used the word rich, by the way. Rich <laughs> Nobody was like does. Nobody something does. other people had, riches. They would have said fortunate. They were mm. very fortunate. There was not a lot of focus on money. The focus was more on wealth and the land and the sort of, I suppose, to some extent, the reputation that came with all that. The birthright, almost. Yeah. Again, I don't know that it would have all been understated. Of course, understatement is absolutely quintessential to this particular class and maybe even more so in my family. Humor is dry and understated. Irony is the preferred (laughs) mode of humor. So birthright, yes, absolutely, but not a word you would have heard. Right, exactly. Nothing more understated than a 50-room house, by the way. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Let's talk about your grandmother. She's one of many sparkling characters and perhaps the most sparkling in the entire book. Uh, My grandmother, the eldest daughter of Robert Leeming Montgomery and Charlotte Hope Binney Tyler Montgomery, was named Helen Hope Montgomery, and she was born in 1904. She was the apple of her father's eye. She was intelligent, good-looking, very ambitious in a way that she would describe as anything that she wanted to do. She wanted to be the best at it. She wasn't, of course, ambitious to become a United States senator. She was ambitious in the way that her parents would have encouraged, which was to be a fantastic equestrian, to nab the best and most desirable husband, and live the most glorious life. She did, I have to say this, work very hard for much of her life in ways that you wouldn't necessarily expect. She took over her father's uh, then crumbling dairy operation after his death in 1949 and turned it into the most productive Ayrshire herd of its size in the country. Uh, She also was a high-level person in a big charitable thing outside Philadelphia known as the Devon Horse Show, which she, you know, it was very, very involved in running it for many, many years, raising a lot of money for a, a local hospital. And she was quite generous and cared a lot about the people who worked on the farm and put people's children through college and even into grad school. But she also was a very colorful, flamboyant uh, society figure, uh, occasionally on the you know best dress lists. Very funny, super racy sense of humor. She once said by a friend to have bought a horse once for a pound of caviar and a dirty story every week for a year. (laughs) Um, And she married Edgar Scott, who had become friendly at Harvard with Philip Barry, the author of The Philadelphia Story. And when The Philadelphia Story opened on Broadway in 1939, the play was dedicated to Hope and Edgar Scott. And From not quite then on, but maybe starting in the 70s, every time my grandma was written about, which was not infrequently, she was described as the model or the inspiration for Tracy Lord. And this became her reputation and a kind of calling card, not that she really needed it. And it also served her purposes in maintaining the farm and her family's place intact throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century. But 
when she died, the Philadelphia Inquirer, her stature in Philadelphia was such that in when she died in the mid 90s, her obituary was stripped across the top of the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer in type roughly the size they used a couple years later for the death of the Pope. There you go. Well, she was kind of the Pope of that area, it sounds like. <laughs> Tell us about some of the parties. What were the parties that your grandparents threw and seemed to be integral to their lives? What were they like and who would come? You know, I didn't actually go to most of their parties, although later in their lives when they were celebrating each other's birthdays and their many anniversaries, et cetera, I did actually, now that you mentioned, I, I went to a few. Uh, they often had parties at the big house at Ardrossan where they would hire people to erect a large tent extending out into this vast lawn, which headed over toward the fields and a ha-ha wall where you would see cows in the distance, but no obvious fence. And they had an enormous range of friends, a lot of theater type friends from my grandfather's period as an aspiring playwright. Uh, he had been famously in love with Helen Hayes. My grandmother said he always uh, probably would have preferred to have married her, but I don't know that that's the case. They knew Noel Coward and a lot of literary figures of the early 20th century, but they also knew the whole society world of Philadelphia and they, you know, the cow world and horses. So the crowd was always pretty mixed and they had these large families and every Sunday night, there was a family dinner at Ardrossan that my great-grandmother started and that was carried on for a while after her death, in which it was expected that if you didn't respond, you were going to show up. You had to respond in the negative if you wished to be discounted to that one. And it was a good idea if you brought friends because it was thought that friends would improve the relationship within the family. So yeah, they lived, lived very well. And everybody who was anybody, they had some connection to. Politicians, celebrities, artists of all kinds. Just glittering list of who's who of the time. That's right. They were, Mary Cassatt was the painter, was a close friend of my grandfather's, I guess a cousin of my grandfather's mother. So they had a house full of Mary Cassatt paintings. They were friendly, as I say, with all sorts of writers. Walter Annenberg, the publishing millionaire who started TV Guide and uh, became the ambassador to the Court of St. James, was a close friend of theirs. My grandfather had either inherited or bought from Walter Annenberg an antique Rolls Royce, which I guess undercuts my suggestion that the family felt kind of like just regular people. <laughs> <laughs> And when my grandmother died, I mean, there were letters from, my great-grandmother died, there were letters from everyone from Strom Thurmond, from South Carolina, of course, mm -hmm. to the, you know, the people who had worked on the plantation. And when my grandmother died, the uh, head of the Ayrshire Club of Sevastopol, Russia, <laughs> wrote, wrote along with many others. So yeah, I, I could go on for, for days. And this is the world into which your father is born. What year was he born? He was born in 19... 29. What was his childhood like? I don't think I ever knew this when I was younger because he didn't talk about it, but I think it was quite lonely. Um, for the first nine years of his life, his parents, or maybe it's a little more than that, his parents had an apartment in New York on Beekman Place, and they spent a lot of time in New York without their two children. My father was the second of two. So he later said that, and I, apparently there's some truth to this because I've heard it from the people who might have been responsible for it, that he, by the age of nine, spoke with a Irish accent because he had been raised by Irish cooks and maids. His mother, when they did return, his mother was very involved in her horse life and her social life and fox hunting. She did many days a week in hunting season. So my father, I think, still was somewhat on his own, but she was around a bit more. And at that point, my uncle, my father's older brother, had gone off to boarding school and then went into the Marines and then went to college. So he was gone from a pretty young age. And according to my uncle, my grandmother then decided, okay, I'm going to focus on making this second one just as I want him to be, <laughs> socially adept. He seems like he was probably naturally socially adept. She thought he was a bit shy. She wanted to get that out of him. She wanted to cultivate all the sort of social skills that she valued. And I think she did a hell of a job in a way that made it possible for him to flourish in certain jobs, but they were also jobs that called upon him to be constantly socializing, which I think 
ultimately conspired with a tendency to alcoholism that existed in both sides of the family to really undermine him. So you talk about how members of his generation worked. What kind of work did he do and what were his cousins and et cetera doing at the time? He graduated from college in 1950 and he went to law school. He went to the boarding school that his family had gone to. He went to the college they had gone to. He went to the law school that his great-grandfather had gone to. And then he joined the firm that his great-grandfather had co-founded. So there was a sort of natural track and he followed it. I mean, he became a corporate lawyer, work that I know he didn't particularly enjoy because I've read his diaries and because I remember that and became increasingly involved over time in civic institutions in and around Philadelphia, a lot of them cultural, but also hospitals, banks, the university. And then when I was 14 and he was in his 40s, uh, he was offered a job as special assistant to Walter Annenberg when he became ambassador to the Court of St. James. So he moved to London and had worked quite hard for four years as Walter Annenberg's sort of all-purpose assistant. He came back and he went back to lawyering, but really didn't enjoy it much and ended up becoming president of the Philadelphia Academy of Music. And then the job that he most loved, uh, president of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the paid president, not just the chairman of the board, uh, for something like 14 to 16 years, uh, a period in which the museum underwent a lot of transformation and shored up its finances, and he was quite successful at that. As for his brother, he was a stockbroker in the family stock brokerage. His cousin, one of his male cousins, told me that he did not get a job in the family stock brokerage and was glad as a result, he was forced to go to Harvard Business School and go off on his own. And he became a businessman and living in other parts of the world. I asked that because when I read about your family's brokerage firm and the work your father did, I got this image in my head from the movie Trading Places, where the commodities firm Duke and Duke, Mortimer and Randolph Duke. And I just felt this old school boys club coming through the pages when you were talking about that firm. I suspect you're correct. (laughs) So, and speaking of movies, you mentioned the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Your father must have been president there when Rocky was filmed, and that's the iconic image from the movie, right? That's right. And I didn't get into this because I couldn't nail down the actual truth, but there was a big controversy in Philadelphia about the Rocky statue, which, as you recall, was put on the top of the steps of the museum for the movie, and then it became an issue, should it be removed? (laughs) And I believe that my father felt very strongly that it needed to go and that it wasn't actually art of the caliber that the museum... (laughs) But I, I couldn't nail down whether it was he or who else was involved in, you know, the decision to force the thing to be removed, which it eventually was. So your father had a severe drinking problem. When you think about genetic and environmental contributors to his behavior, what comes to mind? I can't say that I have an absolutely ironclad answer to that. What comes to mind for me is that going back generations, I discovered in the process of working on this, there had been serious alcoholism in his father's family. There had been excess drinking in his mother's family, but I don't know whether it was Uh, sort of cultural more than genetic, but the line of alcoholics on his father's side was really striking. And this was not, of course, something that was ever discussed when I was a child. It was just a given that everybody drank at all social occasions. And it wasn't even commented upon. It was just sort of accepted. As I said in the book, if you told me that there were people who didn't drink, uh, it would have been like learning that there were people who didn't use soap. It was just (laughs) such an accepted fact in my childhood. And so there was A, there's the family line of alcoholism, and then there's the cultural, social affirmation of that activity. So I think it's pretty hard to separate the two. And then I think there's also some suggestion that particular psychological factors that also can conspire in alcoholism, and it's possible my father had some of those, perhaps a tendency to depression and anxiety, which he, it's very clear from his diaries, uh, felt that he could treat with drinking, or at least that that gave him relief from those feelings. Speaking of the journals, your father mentioned to you that he was going to leave you his journals, but then never said anything about it until, well, ever again. And then after his death, you stumbled upon them and they were arranged in such a way that made it somewhat clear that they were being left behind with some degree of purpose to be found by someone. Probably you. (laughs) Yeah, the whole thing is fascinating and still to me mysterious. Why do you think he left them to you? And what did he want you to find in there? 
Oh, God, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. All I know is that he, in my 20s, after we had, I think, been on a long biking trip together, he said, I want you to have my diaries when I die. And I was so stunned. And of course, they offered, I imagined they offered a window into a person who I found quite mysterious. I couldn't react as, as a reporter might and say, well, why me? Or, you know, I actually, I did say, why me? And he said, you're the writer. But he just said it in a kind of brushing it off kind of way that did not invite further scrutiny. So, But, but does that mean uh, he wants you to write about him or that he wants you to appreciate him as a writer? Could be either of those or could be that you're the only one who would be likely to be interested. Because you're, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the kind of person he was. He, yeah, yeah, he, he would have okay. been self-deprecating about it. And yet, on the other hand, he's handing me this extraordinary, I would say, gift or curse, whatever you, whatever right, you want right. to think of it as. Yeah. yeah, so he said, you're, you're the writer. And I never dared bring it up again, partly because I was afraid he would change his mind and partly because our relationship became quite difficult at times, much having to do with his drinking. And so when he died, I didn't, they were not in any obvious place to be found. And I was busy with my life and didn't pursue it at the time. But when I got interested in doing the book, I began searching, still didn't find anything. And then I was deep into writing it. I was, you know, in the third or fourth chapter when I stumbled upon a single volume in a in a box in my mother's basement, the house my father had left 20 years earlier. And it I, I'd never occurred to me that he would have left the diaries in the house that she where she remained and that he had left behind him. And so I went back and searched the entire house. And in pretty much the last place I looked, I came upon a wooden chest with a padlock on it that I hadn't seen there before. When I approached, the padlock had been left one digit off the last four digits of my parents' phone number, the number they always used for padlocks. Mm -hmm. So it did seem that it was clear what I was supposed to do. I turned the thing one digit and the lock popped open. And inside were 40 years worth of diaries in identical black three ring binders, uh, all organized chronologically and seemingly waiting to be discovered. Was it emotional for you to go through those journals? Yes, but it was also grueling. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Some of it was boring. Some of it was very tough to swallow because he was, it seems to me, really quite honest and confessional in at least about what he believed about himself and what he felt. And a lot of it was scathing. And that was the hardest part to understand the degree to which he had been tortured, which I don't think had really been clear to any of us. I mean, we all knew he drank too much, but he didn't reveal his inner life much, not surprisingly for someone from that class and that period. Uh, So His understanding from a very early age of his drinking problem, long before he ever admitted it to us, not that he ever really did, and his connecting that sense to his also his sense of being a person who wrestled with serious mood swings, depression and anxiety, and just the clarity with which he saw the problems that he was grappling with at the heart of his soul and then wrote them down. That was the part that was... um, most difficult. Which of those things that you learned about him do you identify with now that you're a fully grown adult? I guess that's a really interesting question. I've never been asked. I think the sense that you might be less than people think you are, uh, and just the sort of seesaw quality of that, you know, you shore up your ego and then something happens and you're left to um, confront the evidence that you're fundamentally mediocre. Uh, (laughs) That's why I started this podcast, Jenny. So (laughs) this is all going to fix that. So, (laughs) so I think his sort of charming vulnerability covered with a, in his case, a kind of bravado, we all cover our, that tendency in various ways, Mm -hmm. but I, I suppose that's what I most identified with. I stopped drinking as you know, from the book, uh, at a very young age, I don't know, 19 or 20. I'm not even exactly sure when it was, and I don't know exactly why, except that I now think somewhere deep inside me, I understood this was not going to lead anywhere good, having grown up around a lot of alcoholics. Mm -hmm. So I don't identify with his alcoholism, but uh, a lot of other things I I do. I don't journal, but I am going to leave my daughter my Facebook page. When I'm, <laughs> That's just when I'm as done. good. She'll have insights into the image that I project on the world. My curated 
thoughts of myself, not what's actually going on, but what I want other people to think on. Yes, in future, there's going to be a whole science of interpreting exactly that, what lay behind this rather than what we're supposed to learn from it. We're all so wildly insecure that we have to pretend we're perfect. That's my theory. True. So I want to talk about the effect that Ardrossan and your upbringing had on you. You have this one, it's not a huge part of the story, but it's insightful. You said that once you shared a ride home from college with friends who who dropped you off at the estate. You know, I used to share rides with friends up and back to college and you'd say, oh, this is a nice house for me. Oh, it's okay. Interesting where it came from. I can't imagine having my friends not know that I grew up on an 800 acre estate with several pools, tennis courts, and hundreds of cattle. Like, what did they say to you? When they drop it off. <laughs> yes, it's a testament to my absolute naivete and delusionalness that I didn't even think in advance that this could be <laughs> problematic. You know, and I knew one of these people, but the other one I didn't know at all. I was a freshman in college or a sophomore, thing, and I was driving with a friend who was is a first generation American of Chinese descent, rainy, wonderful character, and a football player who I'd never met. And all of a sudden we're approaching and we're going past this interminable stone wall <laughs> with fields going as far as you can see in the direction. And my friend says, um, so where are the slave quarters? Do you have your own police force? <laughs> and that somehow I remember that moment as like, sort of the dawning of my understanding, which is probably not entirely true, but as a writer, I'll present it as it is, my understanding that this is all much more complicated than I ever appreciated. Yeah, you say you knew the place intimately, but understood it not at all. As I say, I had no idea where the money really came from. I mean, I knew about the railroad president and I knew about the colonel. I didn't know about the colonel's, I shouldn't mention this, I should have mentioned this before, the colonel's humiliation during World War One. that was the source of his title that carried on forever long after the humiliation was forgotten. Right, right. So yeah, all this sort of background, like how this happened, and even the sort of social, historical, cultural context, the rise and fall of Philadelphia, I, I knew none of that. So yeah, that became apparent to me, this thing that I took to be if not benign, you know, slightly embarrassing, but it was what it was, I realized was a very complex, meaty topic. Did your dad pass on the obligation to extend what Ardrossan meant to his family in your own life? Yeah, I should have said that, that in the next generation, whereas there was pressure in his generation to stay and, you know, keep it going, there was never pressure on us to do that. And I don't think there was among my cousins either, one or two of whom have stayed, but it was couldn't be preserved. I think at that point, it was beginning to be accepted that this was going to be finite. My father's only message was certainly not that you need to stay here, which I take now to be possibly that he understood that in making that choice himself, he had dug himself a trap. He had walked into his own trap. And he always said to us, figure out what you want to do, what will make you happy and what will be satisfying work and go off and do it. And you don't owe anything to us. And I, in many ways, I really appreciate that message, although you could say it comes from a place of considerable privilege. So we were not encouraged to do that. What we were encouraged to do was to think about this wealth, whatever it was, land, houses, money, particularly, I suppose, money, as something that was passing through us on its way to subsequent generations. And while we could enjoy uh, the fruits of it to some extent and that there was nothing to be ashamed of in enjoying it, we were not to squander it. We were to protect it and conserve it as though it were a piece of land and then pass it on to, as I say in the book, the next unsuspecting generation. It's a very appealing message if you're interested in wealth preservation, but it's also a little sinister in that we really didn't know how it would play out in our lives any more than we knew how it was playing out in our parents' lives. How does the way you were raised and the opulence you witnessed affect how you think about and deal with money today? My parents didn't talk about money other than that one message I just stated that we were duty bound to preserve this. We didn't make this money we had no right to go and squander it, that we were to protect it and pass it along. But we never talked about like, you know, 
what kind of a salary you could make in a particular line of work or tax problems or anything like that. Interestingly, I later married a man who came from a lower middle class family of small business people. His father had gone bankrupt when he was a child, and they talked about money all the time <laughs> in a way that just shocked me, um, you know, talking about things like what seemed like relatively small amounts of money, you know, how you might invest it and what about, you know, these various tax things. And he knew all the terminology that I was ridiculously oblivious to. So I think growing up like that with no sense of financial insecurity creates a kind of casual attitude toward money that I had and to some extent still have for better or worse. It allows you to perhaps be generous in ways that you might not otherwise feel comfortable being, but it also, I think, especially after working on this book, it possibly deprives you of the impetus that people without money have to really drive themselves to make something of their life and make a mark, either financially or in other ways. So it's as though all that comfort, and I'm not complaining, I'm very, very fortunate, but all that comfort takes a little bit of the energy out of the way you live. Mm. Having had that front seat to multi-generational wealth, what advice would you give to one of these tech tycoons who's made a few hundred million or a billion dollars? Again, I was struck when doing this research by how much thought went into tax avoidance, putting the money in places where it wouldn't be subject to various kinds of tax. I mean, I go into this in the book, but trusts were set up just before the creation of the estate tax, just before the income tax. I mean, everything, when you look at the concatenation of events, you know, when the family trusts were set up and what laws were about to be passed, it seems pretty calculated, a lot of it, to right, make yeah. sure that as much money is preserved as possible. I don't have the sense that as much thought and calculation went into preparing subsequent generations for what this might mean for them and how to think about it. Uh, so I, as I say, was raised with this one idea, and that's it, not the idea that I now feel very strongly, and I have grown children myself now, that the presence of family wealth can inform decisions you make early in your life, major decisions about things like marriage and bearing of children and what jobs you take in ways that you will not be able to anticipate at the time. Uh, for example, you might choose to do a kind of work that doesn't, like journalism, that doesn't <laughs> provide you with a large income. Is that a good thing that you make that choice? Or are you able to make that choice? And I would argue for a degree of consciousness that I did not experience. And in some ways, you'd say not being overly conscious is a good thing because we were able to ignore the presence of our money in my generation where it was considered more embarrassing uh, for a long time, not ultimately forever. Uh, so I would say if you've made a lot of money and you're thinking about taking this approach, which is trying to preserve it over many generations, I mean, personally, I would argue consider another thing to do, which would be to give it all away while you're alive. But if you choose not to do that, then I think it really behooves you to figure out a way to speak to your children so that they understand not only the gift, but also the pitfalls. What values about money do you hope that you've passed on to your children? Well, my children's father, who I'm not married to anymore, but I'm close to, uh, as I say, came from a very different background where his father had gone bankrupt and they were small business people. And he has always been much better about dealing in an upfront way with money for them, you know, figuring out uh, how to talk to them about an allowance, then getting them to have, you know, start IRAs as soon as they, you know, got out of college, talking to them about how to handle the benefits packages they're offered in their work, all sorts of, he knows all that technical stuff, you know, so <laughs> much more than I and my casual approach to money have had to do, even though I've always had jobs. So, on the one hand, they have him uh, with a very hands-on attitude toward money. And then they have me with a obviously less visible relationship to money, but plenty of it. So I think in some ways you could say they got a good thing in that I never felt like competitive with other people about money, which I, I feel in my children's generation, I feel that's a good thing for them and they also don't feel it. But on the other hand, they understand how privileged I am, they are. And the final thing I was going to say was that my ex-husband and I have gone to some lengths to, before my kids get access to and manage their own inherited money, which isn't a huge amount of money, but we've extended it deep into their 30s because I really 
wanted, and he did too, them to fully establish their own careers, what they want, make the choices they make without assuming that they had. And again, it's this is many generations out, so it's not a huge amount of money at this point. It's nothing like people in Silicon Valley, but to make their decisions and lay the groundwork for their lives before they were lulled into a sense of, uh, okay, I'm going to be all right. I think that's really smart. And when it came time to write our estates and our trusts and all that, and they're like, well, what happens if you guys both, you know, die in a plane crash? And you're like, do you want your kids to inherit the money right away? It's like, no, of course not. I want our kids, you know, get a little bit when they're 27, mess that up and then get the rest when they're in their mid to late thirties or something yep, like that. Yeah. Exactly. This has been a fascinating conversation. I'm glad you took the significant amount of time and effort and pain to write the book, because I think it's, it's a very informative story and one that we don't see as much these days in the press and in what's being published. And by that, I mean a frank recognition of the pros and cons of wealth from somebody who's lived it. And so thank you for writing the book and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. It was a lot of fun and really fascinating. Wow. I really am so incredibly grateful to Janie, not just for spending time talking to me on the podcast, but for all the work she put into the book. I think it's really important that we talk about this stuff. And she approaches this project, which was years and years of work. I mean, you can tell from reading the book. She approaches it with a journalist's objectivity and the love of a family member, or at least somebody who can assess the history of Ardrossan and the multiple generations of her family with a lot of empathy for the people involved. Were they good? Were they bad? Who knows? But she has a tremendous amount of empathy in the way she tells the story and a lot of clarity, which comes from the journalistic side of things as well. So I think the story is important because we make a lot of assumptions about other people based on appearances. And so let's jump into the takeaways. Number one is that you never know what's going on with other people. Appearances can only tell you so much. And there's this human tendency that really gets in our way. And that's comparison that we find ourselves thinking, well, sure, I'm doing fine, but you know, Joe next door, has a new Lexus and I'm driving a 12 year old Buick. Okay. Buick's a little cliche, but you don't even know, first of all, if Joe can afford it. But even if Joe's got all the money in the world, that doesn't mean that his life is going just peachily and that there's any reason for you to feel jealous of that person next door. So let's just worry about our own game instead of comparing ourselves to other people. The second takeaway for me is something that is a harsh and consistent theme in this book, and that's that wealth can be very confusing. It can be a trap. Not only can it isolate people in places like Ardrossan, but it can lull them into a false sense of security and rob them of the need to be vital like her great-grandfather. What a sad, this is the most fortunate person of his generation, one of the wealthiest people in the country, and there he is feeling completely worthless as an adult. Man, that's tragic. That's tragic. And few people talk about it. So number one, be careful what you wish for. And again, you know, take some time to read this book and consider what it must have been like to be any member of her family up until her generation and, and including her father. Lastly, talk to your kids about money. You know, every kid has a kid in his class who's got more money, except for one person. And except for one person, there's a kid with less money. And so it's not like our kids aren't out there talking about this or coming to their own conclusions about the way money works in your home or in the homes of others. And the only way to really help them make their way in the world is to talk to them honestly. doesn't mean you have to tell them exactly how much money you make or exactly how much your house costs or, oh, don't worry about so-and-so who has more money because, well, he's a disaster of a human being. I mean, you don't have to talk about it like that, but you should talk to your kids about money. By the way, if you haven't read the book, The Opposite of Spoiled by Ron Lieber, friend of the show, previous guest from like, uh, oh, I'm going to say April of 2019, Ron Lieber's book, The Opposite of Spoiled, is an outstanding resource in figuring out how to talk to your kids about money. Highly, highly recommend it. All right. Those are the takeaways. Like I asked for in the introduction, folks, if you like what we're doing here at Crazy Money, I sure would appreciate it if you would rate and review the show in the app that you're listening to this podcast on. In a world of infinite choice, practically infinite choice among podcasts, your endorsement of the show goes a long way in helping people find this resource, which I hope you enjoy listening to as much as I enjoy making it. Hey, if you can't figure out how to rate it, send me an email, paul at crazymoneypodcast.com, and I'll send you 
my helpful PDF guide to rating podcasts, specifically this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Got a great interview for you next week with the director of one of the episodes in the new Netflix series, Bad Boy Billionaires India. His name is Dylan Mohan Gray. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you sticking around to the end of the podcast. Come back next week. In the meantime, Mike Carano, make me sound smart.